you for spending part of your Sunday with Riverdale. This is Pastor Corey, and I'm so glad that you have joined us right here on Facebook Live. Coming up, I cannot wait to open up God's Word with you with a new message that I hope will help you in your daily walk with Christ. The RBC Praise Team also has a great morning of worship music ahead that will help you set your heart and mind on God's Word. Remember, you can stay connected with Riverdale 24-7 right here on Facebook and on our website, rbcflint.org. Thank you for joining us. Our morning worship celebration begins in just a few moments. And the whole book of Acts illustrates just how faithful a witness Paul was. He brought the gospel to Jews and Gentiles, Greeks and Romans, slaves and sorcerers, philosophers and peasants, kings and commoners. Paul was a witness for Christ, and Paul would witness to anyone, anywhere, at any time, even during a court hearing. Let me just remind you that every Christian stands in this line of being a witness for Christ. Every Christian. You may not have the gift of evangelism, but you have been called to evangelize. Every Christian has that calling. Way back in, in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, we, we looked at this verse two years ago when we first started Acts, and it's there where Jesus tells all his followers, leaders and laymen, Jesus says to them all, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Jesus called every single one of his followers to be witnesses for him. Now that is Acts' version of the Great Commission found in the Gospel of Matthew. You know the Great Commission? Matthew 28, 19. Jesus says, go and make disciples of all nations. Okay, all Christians making disciples of all nations. Everybody say, this is for us. Right, this is for all of us. It's our commission. Do you understand? We are people with a commission. Paul was a man with a commission, and he did not forget that whether he was in prison or on trial. In fact, Paul, what I love here is Paul is not going to use this trial with Agrippa to convince Agrippa he's innocent. No, Paul is going to use this trial to try to convert Agrippa to Christianity. All right, Paul is not going to use this trial to try to negotiate a, a deal with Agrippa. No, Paul is going to use this trial to substantiate the claims of Christianity. Paul is not going to use this trial to pout. He's going to use it to preach. Again, we are commissioned like Paul was. We are called uh, to be witnesses like Paul was. And as we look at how Paul fulfilled his calling, uh, we're going to pull out some key truths about the gospel, about salvation uh, through faith in Jesus. Here's the first one. All right, point number one in our notes, the response to our commission. The response to our commission, uh, in a word, focus. Focus. Look at verse one. So Agrippa said to Paul, you have permission to speak for yourself. So think about it, Agrippa's the king, so naturally he's going to take charge of the proceedings and since there were, there were no accusers present, Paul had the floor. Agrippa said to Paul, verse 1, you have permission to speak for yourself. Then Paul uh, stretched out his hand and made his defense. Paul stretched out his hand. Basically, Paul saluted the king as a, a gesture of honor and respect. And then Paul said, I consider, look at verse 2, I consider myself fortunate that is before you, King Agrippa, I am going to make my defense today. Notice Paul is very courteous to Agrippa. He speaks respectfully with a kind and, and gentle tone. Uh, 1 Peter chapter 3 commands us to be ready at any time to give a defense to anyone who asks you for the hope that is in you, but do it with gentleness and respect. In other words, as a witness for Christ, listen to me, as a witness for Christ, check your tone. Check your tone. People care about what we say, but they also care about how we say it. Our delivery matters to God and to our audience. So when you speak truth, blend it with tenderness. A witness must be both courageous and compassionate. All that to say this, don't be a jerk with the gospel message. 
Paul wasn't. He's courageous and compassionate. He's truthful and tender. He begins his defense by saying, I consider, back to verse 2, I consider myself fortunate that it is before you, King Agrippa, that I am going to make my defense today against all the accusations of the Jews. Paul is not using flattery there. He's not heaping insincere onto Agrippa. He's not trying to butter him up. Paul believed that Agrippa was the best man to hear his defense against all the accusations of the Jews because, verse 3, especially because you, Agrippa, are familiar with all the customs and controversies of the Jews. In other words, as king of the Jews, Agrippa understood Jewish history and theology so he could rightly discern if Paul was guilty of heresy or blasphemy. But Agrippa was also given his position by the Romans. Okay, so he was loyal first and foremost to Rome, which means the Jews, the Sanhedrin, uh, should not be able to sway him. John MacArthur says to Paul, Agrippa was both objective and knowledgeable, making him a prime candidate for conversion. Again, guys, Paul was a witness for Christ, and so the main goal of making his defense, it's, it's not to exonerate himself before Agrippa, it's to exalt Jesus before Agrippa. And so Paul says, therefore, look at the last line in verse 3, therefore, I beg you to listen to me patiently. As a witness for Christ, Paul, notice he is begging, he's pleading with Agrippa to listen to his testimony. Not his testimony proving his innocence, but his testimony proving that Jesus is indeed God's Son and man's Savior. And, And notice Paul asks Agrippa to listen to him patiently. Paul is not going to be brief with the gospel. You know, the gospel's uh, much too important to take the hop, skip, and jump approach. The gospel's much too important to rush through or gloss over. When you give the gospel, when you share your testimony of who Jesus is and, and what he's done for you, take your time. Trust me, I'm going to take my time this morning. Take your time with the gospel. Give the whole gospel. Don't just talk about God's love and mercy. Talk about God's wrath and justice. Don't just talk about forgiveness. Talk about sin. Don't just talk about eternal life in heaven. Talk about death and hell. So you see, people, people need to know why they need to be saved and what they need to be saved from. And so as you share the whole gospel, not some watered-down, sugar-coated, abbreviated version, as you share the whole gospel, do it with a tone of gentleness and with an attitude of humility. Do it like Paul did, a humble begging, a gentle pleading to respond in faith. In 2 Corinthians 5, verse 20, Paul says, We are ambassadors for Christ as though God were making his appeal through us. We beg you on behalf of Christ to be reconciled to God. See, guys, we we beg people, we don't boss them. We plead with the gospel. We don't pummel with the gospel. Again, people care what you say, but, but they also care how you say it. You can be right in what you say, but if you're wrong in how you say it, you're wrong even if you're right. We would do very well to remember that in the sea of slander and hate and disunity that is swallowing our nation right now. Guys, we're ambassadors. We represent Christ. We're his witnesses. Paul never lost sight of that. And so wherever he was, whatever he was facing, Paul represented Christ very well. He always saw himself as an ambassador for Jesus. In Ephesians 6.20, Paul called himself an ambassador in chains. When it came to being Christ's representative, Christ's witness, he was never off the clock, not even when he was in chains. He never lost focus. So I want you to, I want to ask you, have you lost focus? Have you forgotten your mission? Are you still fired up about being Christ's ambassador? Guys, I got to tell you, I believe the church as a whole in the United States, I believe the church has lost focus. In the past year, we have gotten more fired up about politics and presidents and protests and pandemics than about the person of Jesus and the preaching of the gospel. Many of us have forgotten our calling. We've forgotten that we've been commissioned. 
The Great Commission has very quickly become the Great Omission. Some of us have lost focus. We've forgotten, guys, we've forgotten that we're just sojourners here. We're just, we're just passing through and our true citizenship is in heaven. Listen, Satan knows that he cannot alter our citizenship in any way. Our inheritance is guaranteed. Our souls are secure. Once we're in, we're in. All right, nothing can separate us from the love of God. Nothing can snatch us out of his hand. Praise the Lord for assurance of salvation and eternal security. But Satan can make us ineffective. He cannot take our eternal home away, but he can make us ineffective here on earth. And, and I got to tell you, he's done a great job of that this past year. Satan cannot destroy the believer, but he can distract the believer, and believers are distracted. Our response to the Great Commission is focus. Stay focused on sharing the gospel. Listen to me. Um, do you believe the end is near? I don't know. I don't know. I think the minute we start throwing dates out there, that's the minute we guarantee that's not going to happen on that date. I do know we're one day closer to Christ's return. And I do know my life is a vapor, and so what? I'm going I'm to waste it. I'm going to waste my life. I'm going to waste my time arguing about political preference when people are lost and on their way to hell. Arguing about politics is going to make a huge difference in reaching the lost. Not. At times, I have been more fired up about I got to wear a mask and, and, and I can't eat at that restaurant. At times I have been more focused on that than doing the Great Commission. Forgive me, Lord. Again, I ask you, are we closer to seeing Christ than we've ever been before? Are we closer? Well, check this. Until we see Christ, let's never tire of speaking about Christ. See, we're here for Him and nothing else. We're here to be witnesses for Jesus Christ, not warriors for social justice. Until we see Christ, let's never tire of speaking about Christ. If you're like, well, what do I say about Christ? It's simple. Talk about his crucifixion, his resurrection, and then call on people to repent and believe. All throughout Acts, it doesn't matter who's speaking, whether it's Peter or Stephen or Barnabas or Paul or Apollos, different messengers, same message. Jesus suffered in our place, died for our sin, rose from the dead, repent and believe. We have lost sight of that message because we've gotten our eyes on masks and mandates and media, and I'm just as guilty as the next guy. It is time to refocus. We have been put here for such a time as this. We're called to be witnesses for Christ. Your calling, your calling is not Trump supporter or Biden supporter. Your calling is Christ ambassador. We are commissioned to make disciples. So stay focused. Paul did not lose sight of that, not even when he was on trial for his life before Agrippa. Paul, Paul cared nothing for his life. He cared only that Jesus Christ would be exalted. Philippians 1.21, he says, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Now, as Paul is about to give his testimony, in fact, every time Paul shares his testimony, he brings up two things. Two things. Number one, Jesus' resurrection, which proves Jesus is the Messiah. And number two, Paul's transformed life, which proves Jesus' resurrection. Here in Acts 26, Paul starts with his life, what he was like before he became a Christian. All right? Paul begins with his life B.C., his life before Christ. Verse 4, look at that. Verse 4, Paul says, My manner of life from my youth, spent from the beginning among my own nation and in Jerusalem, is known by all the Jews. So Paul goes back to the beginning, his upbringing. You know, Paul came from a very well-to-do family. His family was so prominent, so influential, that they were uh, able to get him into Gamaliel's school. Gamaliel was Israel's foremost expert in Jewish laws and customs. He was the greatest rabbi of his day. So Paul was taught by the best professor at the best university. you got to think, you combine Paul's elite education with his strong personality. I mean, the guy was bold, he was courageous, he had the brains and the brawn, and so he made an impression on the Sanhedrin. 
The Sanhedrin labeled Paul as one who had potential. The Sanhedrin saw Paul as a young man of promise. And Paul says at the end of verse 4, I was known by all the Jews. All the Jews. They all knew me. He goes on in verse 5. Look at that verse 5. They, the Jews, the Sanhedrin, they have known for a long time, if they are willing to testify, that according to the strict party of our religion, I have lived as a Pharisee. So the Sanhedrin were made up of Pharisees and Sadducees. The Sadducees were more liberal and they cared about riches. Uh, the Pharisees were ultra-conservative, and they cared about rules. The Sadducees were tolerant. The Pharisees were tough. The Sadducees, their problem was license. Anything goes. The Pharisees, their problem was legalism. And Paul was part of the strict party, which means Paul was a... He was a Pharisee. Everybody knew what party Paul belonged to. Paul was the kind of Pharisee Jesus talked about in Luke chapter 18. The kind who goes into the temple to pray and says loudly, God, I thank you that I am not like other men. Extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector, I fast twice a week and I give tithes on all that I get. That was Paul. Loud, proud. The ancient historian Josephus described the Pharisees as a certain sect of the Jews that appear more religious than others. Josephus hit the nail on the head. The Pharisees are all about keeping up appearances. They get an A for appearance, but an F in sincerity. Jesus said in Matthew 23, 5, that Pharisees do all their good deeds to be seen by others. Jesus said in Matthew 23, 25, that Pharisees are hypocrites, for they clean the outside of the cup, but inside they are full of greed and, and, and self-indulgence. Jesus said in Matthew 23, uh, 27, that Pharisees are like whitewashed tombs which appear outwardly beautiful but within are full of dead man's bones and all uncleanness. See, that was Paul. He was pretty on the outside, rotten on the inside. A for appearance, F for sincerity. Paul uh, brings up his former life as a Pharisee to prove just how incredible his transformation was. How incredible it was that he even converted to Christianity. I mean, he was the last person that you would ever expect to do that. Look at verse 6. Paul says to Agrippa, to his whole audience, And now I stand here on trial because of my hope in the promise made by God to our fathers, to which our twelve tribes hope to attain as they earnestly worship night and day. And for this hope, I am accused by the Jews, O king. So there's a lot going on there. Let me just try to explain that. When Paul says that he holds to the same hope his fathers or ancestors held to, Paul is saying that he affirmed the teaching of the Old Testament. Now remember, the Jews accused Paul of being a heretical leader who was steering people away from Old Testament teaching. Paul's like, no, I'm standing on trial for holding to the same hope the Old Testament heroes held on to. Guys like Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Joseph and Moses and David, they all hoped in the Messiah God promised would come and through him there would be redemption and resurrection and a whole kingdom of righteousness. This hope that Paul was on trial for was prophesied in the Jews' precious scriptures. God would send a Messiah, a Savior, into the world to redeem people from their sin and slavery. In fact, this hope, uh, if you remember, it was first seen in Genesis chapter 3 in the Garden of Eden right after the fall. The seed of the woman would one day crush the head of the serpent, Genesis 3.15. That seed who would crush Satan, that's the Messiah. And so every, every Hebrew woman from every Jewish tribe hoped that she might be the one to bear that seed, to be the mother of the Messiah. The hope was narrowed down to the tribe of Judah, Genesis 49. It was later narrowed down even more to the seed of David, 2 Samuel 7. God made a covenant with David that from his line there would come a king to rule all people, all nations, for all time. That's the Messiah, the Christ. David knew that. You know, David even comprehended to some degree that the Messiah would first have to die, be buried, and rise again. David prophesied about all of that in Psalm chapter 16, 22, and 69. Israel's hope, the same hope Paul had, the same hope that the Jews who were accusing Paul had, Israel's hope and also the world's hope lay in the promise of a Messiah, a Savior sent by God to redeem mankind, to take away sin and establish a whole kingdom of righteousness. 
See, Paul was saying to Agrippa, the Jews have accused me and charged me with having the same hope they have. It makes no sense. Again, verse 6. Verse 6, Paul says, And now I stand here on trial because of my hope and the promise made by God to our fathers to which our 12 tribes hope to attain as they earnestly worship night and day. So it's interesting, the Jews were still waiting for the promise of the coming Messiah. They were still hoping to see it. They were still earnestly worshiping night and day in the hope that they might attain it. The point Paul is making here is the Jews missed it. Their great hope, the Messiah, he had come and they missed it. You know, it would be like somebody saying, you know, I cannot wait, I cannot wait to see Tom Brady break the record by winning the sixth Super Bowl. You missed it. And that happened like two years ago. Right, and some of you are turned off because I brought up Brady, right? Brady, cheater! <laughs> Illustration, relax. The Jews were hoping and waiting and wondering and praying for the Messiah who would bring redemption and resurrection and righteousness, but they missed it. The Messiah had come. In fact, wherever Paul went, he taught that God's promise of the Messiah, the hope, that hope was fulfilled uh, in the crucified, resurrected Jesus Christ. MacArthur says, by raising Jesus from the dead, God validated the Old Testament promise of the resurrection and at the same time demonstrated that Jesus was Israel's long-awaited Messiah. So guys, it was because tall Paul taught that, that Jesus' resurrection proves he's the Messiah, it was that message that got him in hot water with the Jews. So Paul says in verse 8, look at that with me, verse 8, why is it thought incredible by any of you that God raises the dead? Why is it thought incredible by any of you that God raises the dead? Why is it so hard for you to believe this? I love what John Phillips writes in his commentary on Acts. Listen to this. Anyone who thinks that God cannot raise the dead has a God who is too small. A God who can bind a hundred billion stars into a single galaxy and who can then create a hundred million galaxies and hurl them into the space can certainly raise the dead. A God who can make an atom a million times smaller than the thickness of a single strand of hair, so small that the smallest accumulation of atoms that can be seen under a microscope contains more than 10 billion atoms who can then subdivide each atom into particles so that each one is a miniature universe with a nucleus made up of protons and neutrons, who can then pack into each atom enough power to incinerate a city or dissolve an island is certainly able to raise the dead. A God who can make a human body out of some 60 trillion cells and make each cell so small that it takes a very good microscope even to see one and a super microscope to see inside one, yet each cell a miniature city with power stations, transportation systems, methods of communication, who can make each cell a highly specialized and fantastically complex chemical structure can certainly raise the dead. When we stop to think about the astonishingly complex process by which a human body is created and to think about the even deeper mystery of life itself, it is no more incredible that we should live again than it is that we should live at all. So to steal Paul's words, why is it thought incredible by any of you that God can raise the dead? Not a thing for God. Not a problem for God. And again, the Jews, the Jews their great hope was based on the resurrection. They even said, listen, we, we believe that God can raise the dead. In John eleven twenty four, 24, Martha, the sister of Mary and Lazarus, she was a Hebrew woman. Her Jewish brother Lazarus had died. She says, John eleven twenty four. 24, Martha says, I know that Lazarus will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. The Jews believed that God can raise the dead. They did not have a problem with that, but they had a huge problem with Jesus rising from the dead and being their Messiah. They would not, they would not accept that. And the Jews, the Sanhedrin, when, when faced with the reality that Jesus did, in fact, rise again, do you remember what they did? Remember what they did? They spun this lie that the disciples had stolen his body. They were adamantly against Jesus' resurrection because that would make him the Messiah. Agrippa fell right in line with them. He believed in the concept of resurrection, but he rejected Jesus' resurrection, which means he rejected Jesus as the Messiah. And so Paul says to them, I get it, guys. I get it. I've been there. Look at verse 9. Paul says, I myself was convinced that I ought to do many things. Now let me just stop there and say that that thinking, 
When it comes to being saved and having your sins forgiven, the, th- the, forgiven, the thinking that says, I ought to do many things, that thought process sends a person to hell. And so many people are sincere. They are sincerely convinced that they ought to do many things to be saved, to get to God, and yet it is that thinking that God rejects. It is that thinking that that keeps you separated from God. Back to verse 9, Paul says, I myself was convinced that I ought to do many things in opposing the name of Jesus of Nazareth. You know, the title Jesus of Nazareth showcases the humanity of Jesus Christ. The fact that a man from Nazareth could claim to be the Messiah, God's son, man's savior, history's redeemer. The fact that Jesus of Nazareth would claim that Because nothing good comes out of Nazareth. It was so silly to Paul at first, it was so far-fetched to him that this Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified and considered accursed, could be the Messiah. Paul is saying to Agrippa, I get it, I used to think the same way you do. I used to think not a chance Jesus is the Messiah. See guys, this is Paul's testimony. He's trying to find common ground with his audience. He's letting them know that he's been where they are. He understands. He says there was a time, and it wasn't long ago, when I didn't believe. I was just as much of of an unbeliever as anybody. I was as lost as a person can be. He goes into more detail in verse 10. Look at that. Paul says, and I did so. I, I opposed the name of Jesus. I did so in Jerusalem. I not only locked up many of the saints in prison after receiving authority from the chief priests. So remember, Paul received an official signed document from the leading authorities granting him permission to stamp out Christianity. And so he locked up many of the saints in prison. And look at the end of verse 10. Paul says, when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. So think back to Stephen, uh, who was stoned to death in Acts 7. Do you remember who was there? Who was there? All right, Paul or or Saul at the time. Do you remember what what Paul was doing? Right, he was holding the coats of the Jews. Why? So that the Jews could throw their stones harder and faster. Paul says that when Christians were being put to death, he says, I cast my vote against them. The phrase, I cast my vote, literally means I threw my pebble. This is referring to their method of recording votes. The Sanhedrin would have these these white and black pebbles, and if you threw in a black pebble, that meant conviction. If you threw in a white pebble, that meant acquittal. So what color pebble did Paul throw in when it came to Christians? The black pebble. He said he cast his vote against them. Look at verse 11. Paul says, and I punished them often in all the synagogues. So in the early days of Christianity, when when Paul was still a Pharisee, the followers of of Christ were mostly Jews, and so the the synagogues were, were still their place to meet and worship. So Paul had no trouble finding Christians. He says, I punished them, verse 11, I punished them often in all the synagogues and tried to make them blaspheme. Paul tried to make Christians recant or renounce their faith in Jesus. He tried but he didn't succeed. I love that. I love that. The apostles, you know, they they were all tortured for their faith in Christ. And really, with the exception of, of John, they were all martyred for their faith in Christ. And how many of them, when they were either burning at the stake, hanging from the cross, being fed to lions, how many of them recanted? None. You think about that, the ones who knew Jesus better than anybody, the apostles, they went to their deaths totally convinced, totally unwilling to recant that Jesus was and is Lord and Savior. So just think about that. The ones who know you the best, right? the people who who know you the best, if you said to them, I'm God's perfect son, they would never accept that. Why? Because they know you. They know all about you, and and yet the ones who knew Jesus, the ones who knew all about Jesus, they refused to renounce their faith in him as Lord. He is Lord. Paul, before he was a Christian, he tried to make Christians blaspheme, but he couldn't, and of course that made him even more mad, more furious. So he says at the end of verse 11, and in raging fury against them, I persecuted them even to foreign cities. So Paul didn't just want to stamp out Christianity from Jerusalem, but everywhere. Again, Paul is is making himself relatable to his audience. He says, I hated Jesus. I hated the church. The animosity you feel now, I felt it. 
Paul says, before I was an evangelist, I was a terrorist. Guys, being transparent about your past, being open and honest about the way you used to be, the struggles you used to have, being willing to dig up your past while sharing your testimony, allowing people to see your sin, that can do two things. Number one, it can help you connect with your audience. And number two, it can help your audience understand why you needed a Savior, and maybe they'll reach the same conclusion you did. Maybe they'll admit their sin, ask for forgiveness, and believe in Jesus. And then they'll experience the, tra- the same transfer- transformation you had, the same transformation Paul had. Here it comes. Look at verse 12. Paul says, In this connection, or, or while I was consumed with persecuting the church, I journeyed to Damascus. Damascus, that's about 150 miles north of Jerusalem. That's how far Paul was willing to travel to snuff out Christianity. Paul says, I journeyed to Damascus with the authority and the commission of the chief priest. Now, guys, here's where it all changed for Paul. Here's where the terrorist becomes the evangelist. Verse 13, Paul says to Agrippa, At midday, O king, I saw on the way a light from heaven, brighter than the sun that shone around me, and those who journeyed with me, and when we had all fallen to the ground. So guys, notice, first of all, that Paul is careful to mention that he's not alone. Okay, his traveling companions saw the light. They all fell to the ground. In other words, this was no private hallucination that Paul had. This was real. Everybody there saw it. Paul saw a light. Paul heard a voice. Back to verse 14. And when we had all fallen to the ground, I heard a voice saying to me in the Hebrew language, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. So that's the first time we see that phrase show up in Paul's testimony. He's shared it a couple times before. It is hard for you to kick against the goads. Goads were sharp sticks that were used to poke and prod animals. They were rods used to herd cattle. So God had been poking and prodding Paul through the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit was convicting Paul, and Paul was, was kicking against the Holy Spirit. He was fighting the Holy Spirit. He was resisting God. And guys, I believe that the Holy Spirit started poking and prodding Paul ever since Acts 7 when he watched Stephen die. The passage in Acts 7 tells us that that Stephen's face, as he was being killed, Stephen's face was like the face of an angel. Paul saw that. Stephen shared his testimony right up to his death. Paul heard that. As Stephen was being murdered, he shouted out that he saw the risen Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Paul was there on the scene to witness all of that. And ever since that day, the Holy Spirit had been convicting Paul. Paul tried to silence the Holy Spirit by persecuting the church, but the whole time I imagine Paul thinking, well, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm wrong about all of this, but Paul suppressed that. He pushed it down. He, he, or as Jesus says, he kicked against the goads. See, Paul was fighting against God, and to fight against God is to fight a losing battle. The voice from the light said, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. And Paul said, look at verse 15, and I said, who are you, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. That laid Paul out because now Paul knew he was wrong. Wrong about the church, wrong about Jesus. He was wrong in his beliefs, wrong in his behavior. You think about this. Paul had years of training under Gamaliel. Years of rabbinic schooling which replaced truth with tradition that was all blown to smithereens in a moment. The moment Paul said, who are you, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. Everything changed for Paul in that moment. Paul actually thought that he had been honoring God by persecuting Jesus, but little did he know that by persecuting Jesus, he was in fact persecuting God. The one angels worship, the one who created the heavens and the earth, the one whom all the prophets spoke about was in fact Jesus. He was the resurrected Messiah. And not only was he alive, but he had come to confront Paul face to face. It's remarkable. At this point in Paul's testimony, the the part where he conveys that Jesus is the Messiah, the Lord and Savior, I, I would imagine his audience began to whisper, to murmur. I mean, after all, they believed Jesus was dead and that the disciples had stolen his body, and yet Paul is like, no, I saw him, I spoke to him. Well, you can't do that with a dead man. Look at verse 16. Paul includes more words from Jesus. 
but rise and stand upon your feet. When, so when Jesus tells Peter to rise and stand, that would imply, or when, when Jesus tells Paul to rise and stand, that would imply that Paul, uh, he, he fell on his face. Paul hit the deck, he gets low in a hurry to lie flat on your face. In those days, that uh, was an outward expression of fear, humility, and brokenness, which, guys, those are all attitudes we need to be bringing before Jesus. However, Jesus had work for Paul to do, and you can't accomplish a whole lot laying down. So Jesus said, back to verse 16, Jesus said, Rise and stand upon your feet, for I have appeared to you for this purpose, to appoint you as a servant. The word servant, in the Greek, it's huperitis. Huperitis, it means a common laborer, someone who has a subordinate role, one who takes orders and direction from another. Basically, Paul was now under new management. Jesus was Paul's master. Paul was Jesus' servant. That's how it is with all Christians. Jesus owns us now. Do you understand that? Jesus purchased us with his precious blood. He's our owner. We have signed the title of our life over to him. Point to who the master is. Point to who the master is. Okay? Point to who the servants are. Jesus is the master, the rest are servants. Jesus told Paul, I have appeared to you, verse 16, I have appeared to you for this purpose, to appoint you as a servant and witness to the things which you have seen. So a witness simply tells what he sees. The literal meaning of witness is one who has first-hand knowledge of a, subject, of a subject and can give accurate information concerning it. Did Paul have first-hand knowledge of Jesus? Yeah, he heard the resurrected Jesus. He saw the resurrected Jesus, which, by the way, that's one of the requirements for being an apostle. Okay, apostles had to be called by Jesus, and they had to see the resurrected Jesus. Notice this in verse 17. Jesus said to Paul, I delivered you from your people and from the Gentiles to whom I am sending you. The, the word sending, the Greek word is apostello, apostle. Here, God was calling Paul to be an apostle, and Paul met the main requirement, which is he had to see the resurrected Jesus. Are there any apostles today? Not unless they claim to have seen Jesus in all his resurrected glory. No one has. Don't let anybody today convince you they're an apostle. They're not. But Paul was. Paul was because he was an eyewitness to the resurrected Christ. And as an apostle, as one who was sent, what was Paul sent out to do? To preach the gospel. To preach that forgiveness of sins and, and salvation from judgment can only be found in Jesus Christ. And it is that good news that will open people's eyes. Look at verse 18. To open people's eyes. You know, those whose eyes are closed, they can't see a thing. They're blind, and, and, and that's how the Bible describes unbelievers. 2 Corinthians 4.4 4 says that, that Satan has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they, they can't see the light of the gospel. Unbelievers can't see it. They don't get it. I remember those days. I remember those days of sitting in church and hearing about Jesus and being like, Who cares? This is boring. I don't understand why everybody's so excited. I was blind. I didn't get it. I couldn't see it. How were my, my, how were my eyes opened? It's the Holy Spirit. See, the Holy Spirit took the word of God, the gospel message that was being preached to me time and time again. The Holy Spirit took that and he used that to poke me and prod me. The Holy Spirit used that to convict me and convert me. John 16, 8 says that the Holy Spirit's job is to convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. The Holy Spirit did that in my life. He convicted me of sin, who I am. He convicted me of righteousness, who Jesus is. And he convicted me of judgment, what I deserve and why I need Jesus. It's the good news of forgiveness of sin and salvation from judgment only found in Jesus. It's that message accompanied by the work of the Holy Spirit that opens blind eyes. Like the man in John chapter 9, I was blind, but now I see. That's my testimony. That's Paul's testimony. That's every believer's testimony. Hopefully you have a testimony. Paul was sent to the Jews and the Gentiles, mainly to the Gentiles, to preach the gospel in order to, verse 18, to open their eyes so that, okay, the word so that introduces our second point, the result of salvation. 
the result of salvation. So, guys, if your eyes have been opened, if you were blind but now you see, if you're saved, here's what it results in. Our text gives us four results. Number one, freedom. Freedom. Back to verse 18. To open blind eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God. So before salvation, um, before you receive forgiveness of sins through Jesus Christ, John 8, 44 says that you belong to your father, the devil, and your will was to carry out his desires. So what that is saying is you were in bondage, okay? You were enslaved. You, uh, Satan held you captive. And the Bible uh, describes Satan in a number of different ways. Uh, the God of this age, the ruler of this world, the prince of the power of the air. In Scripture, he is both a serpent and a roaring lion. He can appear as a dragon or as an angel of light. The Bible says that he is a murderer from the beginning and the father of lies, and he holds people captive. We need to be freed from the power of Satan. How can that happen? I can't do it. Neither can you. See, we're not that strong. Uh, Psalm chapter 8, I believe it's Psalm chapter 8, it says that, that we were made lower than the angels. See, we can't, we can't save ourselves, so how can we be set free from the power of Satan? Uh, it is only through the gospel, which is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, Romans 1.16. It's interesting, here in uh, Acts 26.18, Paul mentions the power of Satan, and the Greek word for power in that verse is exousia. It means strong or mighty. However, Romans 1.16, Paul mentions the power of God for salvation. The Greek word for power in that verse is dunamis, which means almighty, all-powerful, omnipotence. Do you get it? Satan's power is no match for God's power. So I'm telling you, no matter what hold Satan has on you, no matter how deep his claws are dug into you, no matter how far gone you think you are, the gospel can save you. It is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. And for those of us who believe, for those of us who've turned from our sin and embraced Jesus as Lord and Savior, we're free. We have turned from the power of Satan to God. My 20-year battle with pornography, gone. Not just on hold, not just pause for the moment, gone. My dad, his, his decades-long addiction to alcohol, gone. It's not just in remission, it's removed, gone. Set free, released from bondage, no longer slaves. If the sun sets you free, you will be free indeed, John 8, 36. Salvation results in freedom. And salvation results in forgiveness. That's the second thing, forgiveness Paul says, I was sent to the Gentiles to open their eyes, verse 18, to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light, no longer blind, and from the power of Satan to God, no longer slaves, that they may receive forgiveness of sins. All right, softball question for you. What does everybody need to be forgiven of? Sins. So in your gospel presentation, if you're going to talk about forgiveness, then you are going to have to talk about Sin. No gospel presentation is complete if it does not confront the person over their sin and their need for forgiveness. If I'm going in to see my doctor for a checkup and he runs some tests and the test results come back and he sits me down and starts talking about chemo and radiation, what would that imply? They got cancer. And if the gospel offers forgiveness, as forgiveness is what every person needs, that would imply that every person is a sinner. If I need chemo, I have cancer. If I need forgiveness, I am a sinner. For all have sinned, the Bible says. All. What is sin? What is sin? 1 John 3, 4 tells us that sin is any violation of the law of God. Any violation of the law of God, that's sin. God's law says, do not lie. Anybody here this morning ever tell a lie? Okay. Uh, if you didn't raise your hand, you're a liar. <laughs> 50% of you are liars. God's law says, do not steal. Anybody here this morning ever take something that wasn't yours? 
God's law says do not covet. Anybody here this morning ever, ever set your heart on something that wasn't yours? God's law says do not lust. Anybody here this morning ever look at and long for and lust over another person? Just me? God's law says do not have any other gods before the one true God. Anybody here this morning ever put something or someone ahead of God? God's law says honor your father and mother. Do I need to even ask? That's just a snippet of God's law. There are over 600 commands in the Old Testament and sin is any violation of any command. Anybody here batting a thousand? Okay, we've just admitted that we're lying, cheating, coveting, lusting, disrespecting idolaters. We've, listen, we've disobeyed what God has said, which means we've sinned against God. All sin is ultimately against God, and so we need his forgiveness. Without it, we die. For the wages of sin is death. That's what we deserve for what we did. I got to tell you guys, if, if my dear wife never forgave me for the years I spent looking at pornography, my marriage would be doomed. There would be no hope without forgiveness. And without God's forgiveness for the lifetime we've spent sinning, we're doomed. We have no hope. However, when I went to my wife and confessed my sin and asked her to forgive me, she forgave me, she forgave me, and she has never once held that against me. And guys, when we go to God and confess our sins and ask her for, for his forgiveness, what does the Bible say? The Bible says that God is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. All unrighteousness. All of it. Past, present, future, all sin forgiven. The Bible says that God remembers our sin no more. That means that, that doesn't mean that God forgives and forgets. Okay, tell me, how much, how much can God forget? Nothing. God does something even better. He remembers our sins no more. In other words, he never brings it up again. He never holds it against us ever. There's nothing like, like being forgiven. It's a relief when others forgive you, but when God forgives you, what an amazing thing it is to know that you are forever forgiven by the God of the universe. How does one receive God's forgiveness? Well, you got to ask him. You've got to fall before him in utter humility and total brokenness, and you've got to admit your guilt, confess your sin, believe in Jesus who took the penalty your sins deserve. Guys, it's, it's ABC, admit, believe, confess. Admit, believe, confess. Are you forgiven? Have you received God's forgiveness through Jesus Christ? Are you saved? If you are, salvation results in, in, in freedom, forgiveness. Uh, number three, a future. Salvation results in a future. Back to verse 18, Paul says, I was sent to the Gentiles to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light, no longer blind, and from the power of Satan to God, no longer slaves, that they may receive forgiveness of sins, no longer guilty, and a place. Some of your Bibles uh, have the word inheritance instead of place. So an inheritance, uh, that was a big deal in Bible times. It, it, it was your future. Esau, you may remember as, as the firstborn, uh, he had a great inheritance reserved for him, but Jacob stole it. You know, the prodigal son, he received his inheritance, but he lost it. You know, the inheritance God gives us through Jesus is different. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 4 describes our inheritance as imperishable, undefiled, and unfading. In other words, it cannot be lost or stolen. And Paul in Acts 26, 18, he uses the word place interchangeably with inheritance. Our inheritance, listen, our inheritance, the thing that's going to set us up in the future, it's a place. Our inheritance is a place, and that place is, drum roll, heaven. You were supposed to do the drum roll, I was supposed to say heaven. All right, listen, if you're saved, you got a place beyond this place. Amen. I'm so glad this isn't as good as it gets. I'm so glad we're not living our best life now. How depressing would that be? And yet Joel Osteen wrote a best-selling book called Live Your Best Life Now. No thank you. No thank you. Earth is not heaven. We got to stop trying to make it heaven. It will never be. 
Our best life is ahead when we receive our inheritance, when we reach our place. Twelve days ago, one of our own, Don Liversedge, he received his inheritance. He's in his place. I mentioned at his funeral that one day in heaven is like a thousand years on earth, and so did Don. It seems like he's been in heaven for like 12 seconds. And honestly, it's going to seem like in about another 12 seconds, we will be where he is. Say amen if you're ready. I'm so ready. The point is, we don't have to fear what's ahead. We don't have to dread what's coming. We don't have to wonder where all this is going. We know we got an awesome ending coming. Now, is it going to get bad before it gets awesome? Yeah, but it will get awesome. Christians have a future because Christians have an inheritance, and the Christian's inheritance is a place, and that place is heaven, imperishable, undefiled, unfading heaven. Our very best day here on earth will pale in comparison to every day in heaven. Right? No bad days in heaven. Salvation results in freedom, forgiveness, a future. And number four, okay, how many of you think the fourth is going to start with letter F? You won't be disappointed. Fellowship. Salvation results in fellowship. Again, verse 18, Jesus told Paul, I'm sending you to the Gentiles to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place, notice this, among those who are sanctified. You know, the moment we're saved, we become part of this whole new community, the community of those who are sanctified. The word sanctified means to be set apart, okay, to be set apart from the world, uh, to live for the Lord, to be set apart from the world to live for God, that's not easy, all right? How many of you have felt the tug of war between the things of the world and the things of God? Okay, we all live in that tension, but as Christians, we're in this thing together. See, we can pull in the same direction together. The moment I got saved, I now had all these new brothers and sisters, right? Some of them were weird. But I, I got this family, and we're not perfect, but we need each other. We need fellowship. When God created Adam, he said that it was not good for man to be alone. Years ago, I went to see Michigan play Duke in basketball. I'm a Duke fan. Most of you know this. I did not grow up in Michigan, so I'm really not a fan of the Wolverines. I'm sorry. I don't really have any feelings towards them, honestly. Um, and so I, I drove to... Ann Arbor wearing my Duke hoodie, and uh, I took my seat in the arena, and I was in hostile territory. Uh, fortunately, I wasn't alone, because right next to me were Tim and Jenny, and, and they were cheering for the same team I was. They were, uh, you know, they were wearing the same kind of hoodie I was. I wasn't alone, is the point. Guys, we need the church. We need the fellowship. We need the family. We live in a hostile world. And we need people to our right and to our left encouraging us, strengthening us, standing and, and cheering for the same things we're cheering for. Salvation puts us in a whole new family, a whole new fellowship. There, see, there's a reason the word church in the Bible means gathering and assembly. It reminds us that we're not supposed to do the Christian life alone. Okay, all, now listen, all these incredible benefits of salvation. Salvation brings amazing results, freedom, forgiveness of future, fellowship, but how does a person get saved in the first place? You know, how is freedom and forgiveness and, and a future and fellowship, how does a person come into possession of that? Yeah, it's through salvation, but how is a person saved? This brings us to our third point, the requirement of salvation. The requirement of salvation. Faith. Another F word, right? Boy, that sounded bad, right? <laughs> Faith. We, maybe we can edit that. I don't know. All right, one more time, verse 18, which, by the way, I'm looking at the clock. I got to move. Uh, we're only in verse 18. I got to get to 32, all right? Uh, Jesus says to Paul, verse 18, I'm sending you out to open people's eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified. Here it is, by faith in me. By faith in me. It's, it, it's only by placing your faith in Jesus who suffered and died and rose again that you receive freedom, forgiveness, a future, and fellowship. That's it. It's faith in Jesus and only faith in Jesus. It's faith in Jesus apart from any human works. 
Acts 13.39 says, Everyone who believes in Jesus is freed from everything which you could not be freed from the law of Moses. Acts 15.9 says that our hearts are cleansed by faith in Jesus. Acts 16.31, Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. John 3.16, Whoever believes in Jesus will not perish but have everlasting life. Here's what it comes down to. It's, It's so simple. It's so simple, yet it's so hard for people to come to terms with. We cannot do anything to save ourselves. We just can't. We can't earn it or work for it. I get it. You know, most of us were brought up in homes where we were taught, if you want anything, you got to work for it. Right? You, you earn what you get. And so naturally, we carry that mindset over to salvation, eternal life. We, we think like Paul thought at first. I myself was convinced that I ought to do many things. Guys, when it comes to our salvation, here's the do. It's one thing. Here's the do. The do is to believe that Jesus already did it. That's it. The do is to believe that Jesus already did it. Jesus died to pay for your sin, and he rose again to offer you new life. Jesus did that. He did what we couldn't, and so believe in him. You're saved through believing, not behaving. The behaving usually comes after Right? And, and so those who claim to believe in Jesus, there will be evidence. Okay, So here's where the behaving comes in. There will be proof. And that brings us to our fourth point, the proof of salvation. Here it is in a word, fruit. Fruit. How do we know Paul was saved? Right? If I were to ask you, uh, how do you know you're saved, don't tell me how to get saved. Oh, I put my faith in Jesus for my salvation. I didn't ask, how do you get saved? I asked, how do you know you are saved? How do we know Paul got saved on the road to Damascus? Because after Jesus told him he would be sent out to preach the gospel, notice his response, verse 19. Paul shares in his testimony, verse 19, Therefore, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision, but declared first to those in Damascus, then in Jerusalem, and throughout all the region of Judea, and also to the Gentiles, that they should repent and turn to God, performing deeds in keeping with repentance. So notice, where God told Paul to go, Paul went. What God told Paul to preach, Paul what? He preached. The proof Paul was saved, was, the proof was in the fruit. Matthew 7 says, by their fruits you'll recognize them, and every tree that does not bear fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. The proof is in the fruit. In the fruit, listen, the fruit is obedience. The evidence that somebody has put their faith in Jesus for salvation. Because, guys, anybody can say that. Anybody can say, I believe in Jesus. But, you know, many times talk is cheap. And actions speak louder than words. And so the one who believes in Jesus obeys Jesus. What did Jesus say about it? He said, uh, if you love me, you'll what? You'll keep my commands. Genesis 15, 6 uh, says that Abraham believed and his faith was counted to him as righteousness. Well, how do we know Abraham believed? Hebrews 11.8 is how we know. That verse says, by faith, Abraham obeyed. Obeyed. You know, the phrase, uh, it's an old phrase, the proof is in the pudding. Okay? The original phrase is, the proof of the pudding is in the eating. I like that better. How can you tell it's pudding? You, you eat it, and hopefully what's in that bowl is pudding. Listen, just as as the proof of the pudding is in the eating, the proof of salvation is in the obeying. Okay, it's not in your singing or in your saying. The proof is in your obeying. Just like that song says, obedience is the very best way to show that you believe. The proof's in the fruit, and the fruit is obedience. Obedience to what God says. Obedience to his commands. When God says do, Christians do. Not perfectly, but increasingly. When God says don't, Christians don't. Not perfectly, but increasingly. See, guys, make your calling and election sure by asking yourself, is the fruit of increased obedience being evidenced in my life? Look at verse 21. Paul says to Agrippa, for this reason, for the simple fact that Paul was traveling all over the world offering salvation to the Gentiles. You think about it, the Jews hated, hated the Gentiles. And the fact that Paul told the Gentiles that they could be saved without becoming Jews, for that reason, verse 21, the Jews seized me in the temple and tried to kill me. 
So that happened back in Acts chapter 21. That, that was actually what led to Paul being in chains in Caesarea. Verse 22, Paul says, To this day I have had the help that comes from God. God protected Paul from the Jews killing him. Remember, the Jews planned two ambushes. Neither of them were successful. God, God made sure of that. To this day, verse 22, to this day I've had the help that comes from God, and so I stand here testifying. It's only because of God that I stand here testifying, both to small and great. I love that the gospel is for both small and great. No one's exempt. The gospel's for people from every walk of life because people from every walk of life have the exact same need, Jesus Christ. The gospel's for everyone. So Paul says, I stand here testifying both to small and great, saying nothing but what the prophets and Moses said would come to pass. All right, Paul's stressing there, listen, my message is not heretical, it's biblical. It doesn't go against Scripture. It's actually the fulfillment of Scripture. Paul could fully support his message with Old Testament quotations. In other words, he didn't make this up. And here's Paul's message, verse 23, that the Christ must suffer, crucifixion, and that by being the first to rise from the dead, resurrection, he would proclaim light or salvation both to our people and to the Gentiles. So Jesus' crucifixion plus Jesus' resurrection equals mankind's salvation. That's the message. Paul's like, I preached that the Messiah must suffer. You got to know that wasn't a new message. David prophesied this in Psalm 22. So did the prophet Isaiah in Isaiah 53. Paul also preached that the Messiah would rise from the dead. That wasn't a new message either. David prophesied this in Psalm 16. So did Job in Job 19. Again, Paul is he's proving to his audience that he's no heretical leader speaking lies. Look at verse 24. As Paul was saying these things, that Christ must suffer and then rise again in order for the Jews and Gentiles to be saved, as Paul was saying these things in his defense, Festus said with a loud voice, okay, so here's our last point, the reaction to the gospel. The reaction to the gospel. How will people react when you share the gospel? Well, some, like Festus, will think it's foolishness. Foolishness. Back to verse 24. As Paul was saying these things in his defense, Festus said with a loud voice, Paul, you are out of your mind. Your great learning is driving you out of your mind. That word mind, the Greek word is uh, mania. And Festus is calling Paul a maniac, a lunatic, a, a crazy person. Festus is like, if Jesus is dead, he's dead. I mean, once you're dead, you're dead. Paul, you've totally lost touch with reality which I have to say, it's not a shock. Paul was called crazy when he preached the gospel. The same thing happened to Jesus. Mark 3.21 says that when Jesus' own family heard him speak, they said to him, you are out of your mind. John 10.20, many said of Jesus, he has a demon and is insane. Why listen to him? How many of you here think that when Jesus taught, he did it perfectly? Jesus taught perfectly. Okay, if He did. He taught perfectly, and if Jesus couldn't win them all, what chance do you think you have? All right, and when, listen, when someone calls you crazy for sharing the gospel, you can tell yourself, I'm just like Jesus. People called him crazy, and I guess sometimes crazy is not the worst company to be in. Festus tells Paul, you are out of your mind, but Paul said, verse 25, but Paul said, I'm not out of my mind. Paul, Paul was the only guy there who had the right perspective on time and eternity. Paul was the only guy in the whole auditorium who was in touch with both this life and the next life. Paul was the only guy there who knew Jesus. He's not out of his mind. Paul says, I, I'm not out of my mind, most excellent Festus, but I am speaking true and rational words. i got to point this out. So Festus called Paul crazy, and Paul calls Festus most excellent. Paul doesn't trade jabs with Festus. Paul is still so kind, and that's because Paul was more concerned for Festus's soul than he was about his own ego. And let me ask you, uh, would Paul have a better chance of reaching Festus by being rude or polite? This goes back to what I said earlier. Don't be a jerk with the gospel message. Paul goes on to say in verse 26, for the king knows about these things, and to him I speak boldly. For I am persuaded that none of these things have escaped his notice, for this has not been done in a corner. So basically, Paul's saying Christianity is not some secret cult. 
The message about Jesus the Messiah is rooted deeply in the Old Testament scriptures, and since Agrippa was familiar with Jewish customs and traditions, then he would certainly understand what Paul was saying. And so Paul says in verse 27, King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know that you believe. In other words, Agrippa, if you accept what Moses and the prophets wrote, then you have to accept that Jesus is the Messiah. Now I love, I love that Paul comes right out and asks Agrippa personally, do you believe? The gospel demands a personal response. And after you share it with someone, you must be ready to ask them personally, do you believe? What's your response? What are you going to do with what you just heard? By doing that, you are giving that person a clear chance to either accept Christ or reject Christ. But guys, at some point, you have to ask, do you believe? I've stressed the importance of being gentle with the gospel, but gentle doesn't mean cowardly. And so you've got to be bold enough to ask for a response. Some will think the gospel's total foolishness. And some will react out of fear. That's the second reaction we see in the text, fear. Paul straight up asks Agrippa, do you believe? Notice Agrippa's response, verse 28. Agrippa said to Paul, in a short time, would you persuade me to be a Christian? Paul, you think one conversation's going to do it? I mean, you want me to believe in Jesus after one conversation? Paul's like, that's exactly what I want. Look at verse 29. Paul says, whether short or long, I would to God that not only you, Agrippa, but that also all who hear me this day might become such as I am, except for these chains. Agrippa, if you need more time, if you want more discussion, I'll, I'll stay as long as it takes. If it would mean that you or anyone here would come to know Jesus as Lord and Savior, I'll stay for as long as it takes. Look at verse 30. Then the king rose, and the governor, and Bernice, and those who were sitting with them. Agrippa didn't want more time with Paul. His mind was made up. He was not going to believe in Jesus because if he did, he would look like a fool to the Romans because they all thought Jesus was dead. And Agrippa, if he believed in Jesus, he was afraid of what the Jews would do because they hated Jesus. Agrippa was afraid. And so when Paul asked him, do you believe He just got up and walked out, and everybody followed. Verse 31, And when they had withdrawn, they said to one another, This man is doing nothing to deserve death or punishment. And Agrippa said to Festus, This man could have been set free if he had not appealed to Caesar. So they all agreed. They all agreed, guys. Paul's innocent. He may be mad, but he's not bad. They could have let Paul go, they should have let Paul go, but they're, you know, they're using this whole thing with Caesar as an excuse to keep him in chains and ship him off to Nero. They, they didn't have to do that. But you see, Festus wanted Paul gone because he couldn't stand to hear any more foolishness from him. And Agrippa wanted Paul gone because he was afraid. He lived in fear of what his peers would do if he believed in Paul's message. Okay, the point is, listen, we made it. We got through everything. Okay, here's my final point, which thank you guys for turning me down. I can't imagine screaming at you for uh, well over an hour. Okay, we have the best sound guys back there, by the way. The point is this. I got off track there. The point is this. We cannot control how people react to the gospel. We just can't. You know, we would like to win everybody. Um, obviously we know that Jesus is not the majority position, so we cannot control how people react to the gospel. The result, the response, that's not on us. Just stay focused to your calling. Remember your commission. Tell people about their need for Jesus. That's all you can do. God's in control of the results, and you can trust him, whatever that result is. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. We thank you for just how awesome your word is. How it speaks to us right where we're at. God, we thank you for saving us. God, thank you for loving us while we were sinners and sending your son to die for us. God, thank you for your Holy Spirit which poked us and prodded us and convicted us. 
God, thank you for bringing us to that place of repentance. Thank you for giving us the faith to believe in Jesus. And God, thank you that even though uh, we still sin, you keep us. You love us. Nothing can snatch us out of your hand. Thank you for that eternal security. Thank you for the freedom and forgiveness and the future and the fellowship that we have all because of Jesus Christ. God, I pray that if there's somebody here this morning who does not know Jesus, whom to know is to have life eternal. If there's somebody here today who is outside of of, uh, your family, they are on the outside looking in. They have not experienced freedom, forgiveness. They don't have a future. They don't enjoy fellowship. God, I pray that your spirit would work. I ask Anybody here this morning who doesn't believe in Jesus, after hearing this message, I flat out ask, do you believe? What is your response? What are you going to do with what you've just heard? God, bring somebody to saving faith in Jesus Christ today. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.